We're talking about this Jesus. You know, Paul said this Jesus, which was crucified. He talked about this Jesus. We're talking about this Jesus. We're talking about a God that became a man. And he went to the cross because he had to be a man to go to the cross. But I want to show, we were talking about last time about Jesus in hell. And that the soul went to hell. And we talked about that this morning. We're going to talk again about what happened to that body when Jesus was in hell. Amen. If you will go with me to John 10, verse 17 and 18. We are going to see what Jesus himself says about the situation that he, that he was getting ready to go to. He was getting ready to go to the cross. And he said, verse 17, Therefore does my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. We saw that earlier. No man could kill Jesus. The Jews couldn't kill him. The Romans couldn't kill him. He gave up the ghost. He did everything that was told him to do from the scriptures. He did everything that was written about him. And when he was all done, when everything was done that he needed to do on the cross, that is when he said, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost. No man could kill him. He gave up the ghost. Now his soul is in hell. And we are going to see what happens to that body. It says, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. To, and I have power to take it up again. Amen. This commandment have I received of my father. Jesus could not have done this as a man. Remember, he is a man now. He has given up all his godly ability, all of it. He has become nothing. He has become a man just like you and I. He could do nothing on his own. He could do no miracles. He couldn't do a miracle. It was the Holy Ghost and the Father working through him. Jesus himself said, of my own self, I can do nothing. Do you know that included when he went to the cross? He couldn't do a thing. He had no power in him. The only power that was with him was the Holy Ghost and the Father working through him. And while he was on the cross as a man like you and I, Taking the pain as a man, as a man, not a God, a man. The Holy Ghost working with him. And the Father is, if you remember, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God forsook him on the cross. He forsook a man on the cross. Do you get that? He forsook a man on the cross. Because that man had become you and I's sin. That man became our sin. Everything that we had ever done. And everything that will ever be done. Every sin went on that body. Went on that body. In his soul. And God had to turn his back on him. And you know what the wonderful thing is? This is Jesus' darkest hour. This is the worst time that Jesus has ever existed. It is his darkest hour. But it is our glory. It is our glory. Jesus did this for our glory. Jesus did this because he loved us. What a remarkable thing that a God, a God, decided to become a man and take this dark hour for us. That is our glory. Hallelujah. That is our glory. Now, he, because he became sin, when Jesus died, he didn't die clean. He died a sinner. He died the world's worst sinner. He died with everybody's sin on him. He died with your sinner, your sin on him. Everything you've ever done, every unbelief, every fear, every, every sin, every sin went on that body, and that body died a sinner. Well, what happens to sinners? As we said this morning, Jesus went to hell. He had to go to hell. Why? Because he, he had sin in him. He had all sin. And it says in Psalm 88, he went to the lowest pit. Now, what happened to that body? What happened to that body? All right, let's go to John 19. I'm going to begin in verse 33. But when they came to Jesus, and this is Jesus on the cross, he had just said, it is finished, and he just gave up the ghost. Remember, folks, he gave it up. He gave it up, and he wasn't going to give it up until everything was done. He was not going to die until everything was done he needed to do. And then he said, it's finished. And he gave up the ghost. He said, but when they came to Jesus, they saw he was dead already. And I want to make it clear. Jesus here is dead. His spirit. 
spirit is gone. His soul is gone. It's on its way to hell. Jesus is not here. His body's here, but he is gone. His spirit and his soul has left his body. Remember he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He's gone. There is nothing but a carcass here. And it says, but when, but when they came to Jesus, they saw he was dead already. They broke not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out blood and water. And when he saw the bare record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith is true, that you might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saying, they looked on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. And he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Mark says they took it down off the cross. They took it down. They took a carcass down. Jesus is not here. He said, and there also came Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, brought a mixture of myrrh and alice, about 100 pounds weight. And they took the body of Jesus, and they wound it in the linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher, where never a man yet laid. There they laid Jesus. Before, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was not at hand. They left a dead body in the tomb. They wound it up. Now, what was on that body? What was on that body? If you will turn with me to Isaiah 53, I want you to consider this verse. Remember, Jesus died a sinner. Well, he also died a sick man. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. That word grace is sickness, and that word sorrows is pain. Surely, surely he has borne our sickness and carried our pain. Yet we did esteem him stricken that God him afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. This body was wounded. It said, and he was bruised for our iniquities. It's pierced. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. That body that they stuck in the tomb had every sickness and disease on it. That body still had sickness, folks. That body that they put in the tomb was not healed yet. It wasn't healed. It was sick. It was sick. That body had cancer on it. That body had leukemia on it. That body had arthritis on it. That body had sugar diabetes on it. That body had every sickness and disease known to man on it. It had every flu. It had every sexual transmitted disease on that body. That's what they put in the tomb. A sick body. A body with every disease you and I could ever have was on that body. And that's what they wrapped up and stuck in the tomb. Now, now we got a sick body that had every sin on it. That body that was, that was scorched. That body that was nailed to the tree. That body was wounded. That body had stripes on it. They put that body back together because every bone was out of joint. So Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea kind of put the body back together. They wrapped it in 100 pounds worth of spices. That's a lot of spice, folks. And they stuck it in a tomb. Now what happened to the body? Go with me to Acts 2. I'm going to begin in 22. A marvelous, exciting, wonderful thing happened to that body. A marvelous and exciting and wonderful thing happened to that body. It said, 22, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man, a man, not half God man, a man, a man approved of God among you by miracles and signs and wonders, which God did by him. Do you see that? God did. God did. Jesus couldn't do any miracles because he was a man. It says that God did by him, by Jesus, Uh, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, the prophet David, speaking by the Spirit of Christ, said, 
I first saw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. This is Jesus himself speaking, his spirit speaking through David the prophet. And look what he says. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh, my flesh, not my spirit, not my, not my soul, my flesh shall rest in hope. My flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell and neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Why did that flesh rest in hope? It wasn't going to see corruption. If you go back down to 31, he said, and seeing this before spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell and neither his flesh did see corruption. You know what that word means, corruption? It means decay. That body, that sick body, that wounded body, that pierced body, that body with the strokes on it never decayed. Not one cell decayed. It says never saw corruption. Never saw decay. That body never saw decay. Why? Look back in verse 26. It says, therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also, my flesh, my flesh, that body, that body, with my spirit gone and my soul gone, that body will rest. Rest. Do you know what that word means? Look it up. It means dwell. And it means to dwell in hope. And you know what that word hope means? It means confident expectation. Confident. That flesh rested in confident expectation. Expectation. Amen. That body, that flesh, not the soul, not the spirit, the flesh rested in confident expectation. Why? Because it knew what was going to happen. That body knew Jesus was coming back. That body knew Jesus was coming back. Go back with me to John 10. What did Jesus say? Amen. In verse 18, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down to myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power, authority to rise it up, uh, to take it up again. This commandment have I seen, have I gotten from, received of my Father. That commandment I received of my Father, that flesh rested in confident expectation. And how did it do that? How did that flesh rest in confident expectation? I want you to turn with me to Mark 10. Amen. There's a marvelous statement here that gives us a hint of why that body rested in confident expectation. There's two verses I want us to look at here in Mark 10. And also, in, uh, we're going to look back at um, Matthew. All right, Mark 10. It says, verse 20, and in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree that Jesus had cursed with his own words. In fact, if you look at Mark or in Matthew, it says that Matthew uh, spoke to the fig tree and the fig tree immediately dried up. Immediately. Amen. It says, when they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remember it said, Master, behold, here's the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus said unto them, have faith in God. Amen. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. How did Jesus handle that fig tree? He had faith in God. He wasn't telling the disciples to do something that Jesus didn't himself do. How did Jesus, how did Jesus destroy the fig tree? He had faith in God. How's Jesus going to be raised again? He had faith in God. He had faith in God. He had faith in God. God gave him a commandment to lay his life down, and he gave a commandment to raise it again. Jesus had faith, confident expectation God was coming to get him. He had so much confidence and expectation that the body waited for him. The body rested, dwelled in confident expectation. Jesus was coming back. What does it say in Acts? He said, it said, uh, let's go back to Acts 2. Marvelous statement. He said, it was impossible, impossible that the grave would hold him. Impossible. That's why the flesh could rest in hope. Jesus was coming out. And if you look with me at Matthew, tw um, no, I'm sorry, Matthew 26. 
Amen. Excuse me, I lost it. Matthew 26. Amen. Thank God. Thanks, God. Amen. Thank God. Verse 32. And Jesus said, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Do you hear that? He's telling the disciples, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried. But after I'm risen again, I'll meet you in Galilee. I'll meet you in Galilee. Do you see? Jesus knew he was coming out of the grave. There was no question that he was going to come out of the grave. Jesus knew he was coming out of the grave. He had that hope, that faith in God. He was coming out. He knew he was. Why? Because God gave him the commandment. God gave him the commandment. He was coming out. And why did that flesh rest and dwell in confident expectation? Because Jesus had the faith. He had the faith that the Father was coming to get him out of hell. That the Father was going to raise him from the dead. Jesus had to have that faith. Why? Because he was a man like you and I. That's how he got out, folks. He had faith in the Father that the Father was going to raise him from the dead. And faith is audastic. Faith doesn't see anything else but what is going to occur. And Jesus knew. He knew that he was coming out of the grave. That's why that body never saw any decay. Amen. 